All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this bright and sunny Wednesday morning for financial fitness for seniors during the holidays and beyond. This morning, we have a terrific repeat speaker, um, Joe Soricelli, who's the founder and president of Aging Issues, Inc., which helps individuals and families plan to live better. He's been involved in the Senior Law Day Collaborative, which we're all participating in this morning since its inception. And he's a registered rep with LPL Financial and is all ready um, to celebrate this festive holiday season with you. So without further introduction, Joe, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm excited to learn all about your presentation. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen just to start now because I gotta lean over a little bit. All right. All right, let's 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 talk about, uh, again, Joe Soricelli. Uh, let's talk about, you know, what we're gonna, what we're gonna do today. We're gonna, we're gonna describe to you what you should be doing this time of year and pretty much all year long to have financial fitness. So there, let me tell you a little bit, of, you know, about the agenda, right? It's the introduction, who I am. I am a financial consultant. Right? I am a financial advisor. I am a rep registered representative. We're going to then talk about budgeting and organizing and managing daily finances. That's so important. Right? We're going to talk about financial literacy. We're going to talk about investing. We're going to talk about a bunch of things. And I'm going to go through this relatively quick. I am not going to turn around and do it all into it because I want you to take away from here a couple of to do's, not necessarily. Uh, things that, that scare you, but things that you should be doing to have fitness. Let's face facts. Fitness is repetitive. It's not, it's not a one-time uh, option. You don't, you don't exercise one time and expect to be financial, uh, you know, physically fit. Just like you don't create a budget. You don't do these, uh, any of the hot things that we're going to talk about one time. You do them consistently, but I have to make you aware of them. That's really the key. Let's talk about me. Uh, you see in the background, you see a Santa jacket. I play Santa. That jacket's been around for close to 20 years. My wife keeps on wanting to replace it and get a new one. Uh, I think I'm getting one for Christmas. I am a family person. My entire life has been around my family, extended being my parents, who I have helped care for. My father in the bottom left-hand corner, he lived to 99, 99 and change, almost made it to 100. I do present a lot at, at you know, Senior Law Day. Uh, top left was an old, uh, you know, an old presentation. I think that was up in Yorktown, you know, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, maybe, and, and 10 years and about 30 or 40 pounds ago, uh, I've, done, I've shrunk getting physically fit. And then I have this whole big extended family that I talk about, that's multi-generations. I, I pulled up the PowerPoint, but I didn't turn it, I didn't uh, bring it out. So, hey, that's me with a white beard and everything. So we've talked about it. But again, dad is in the left-hand corner, uh, me in the right-hand corner. I missed, you know, that's that good old technical difficulty. So now we have to look at the next piece. I talk about budgeting extensively. And why do I talk about budgeting extensively? That's where it all starts. If you don't know where you're at, if you don't know how much money is coming in is, is this budget slide shows. Monthly income from one, where is it coming from? Monthly income from two, if you're married, where is it coming from? And then all of these expenses. It's so important to have this snapshot. This is part of a financial plan. What you're gonna see is a couple of slides from financial planning software that I use with all my clients. But when you start with financial fitness, you first have to have, where are you? Uh, I'm overweight. I have to lose weight. Well, I don't have enough income. How do I generate more income? Oh, wait a minute. I spend too much money. Where is it actually going? Anybody ever realize sometimes you don't know where it's going? A lot, some people are in a position where they can't spend the money they have. Most people are not. So you have to have this picture. And we're going to talk about something that's really in the news today in a couple of slides. And this presentation was given a couple of times, I think in in March, in October, and now, you know, now in December. But inflation is a big factor because unfortunately, 
a lot of the things that you're looking at as far as expenses have gotten more expensive, right? They've increased. Now, after we talk about expenses in a financial plan, we have to sit back and say, all right, how do I pay these expenses, right? People have incomes. People have uh, basically sometimes pensions, social security, other forms of income. But other people have to live off of their investments. So one of the things that in you know being financially fit is really understanding what investing is. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the basics of investments. And probably the most popular tool is using mutual funds. Many people are savvy, uh, financially savvy, and will invest in stocks. We've heard about, you know, uh, Apple stock, you know, moving, doing very well. We've heard about Tesla doing very well. They move up and down. But most individuals use some form of mutual fund or ETF, basically pools of investments that invest in various pieces, and they are professionally managed, right? Uh, most of the time, if you're still working or have a 401k, they're, they're, in the, they're being used inside there to turn around and invest your retirement savings. And part of it is because it's, it's a, it, it diversifies your overall portfolio. Now, you can do it yourself, right? Or you can, you can change. Because when you want to turn around and invest, you have to look at more than one type of investment. So what you actually are going to create, whether you do it or somebody does it for you, is some form of asset allocation. It's, it changes. It moves risks. You have this return number. I need to generate X number of dollars. But how do I generate that money? And how much risk am I willing to take to generate that return? If you want to have zero risk, you invest in money market accounts at a bank, CDs, uh, basically a no risk investment. You know exactly what the return is gonna be from today to a year from now, possibly five years from now. If you do a five year CD or a five year bond, you know exactly, low, low risk. On the opposite side, uh, there are companies that were worth a dollar in January that are worth 20 cents today. There are other companies that were worth 20 cents in January and are worth a dollar today. So what you're seeing is this tremendous amount of volatility. So most people have an asset allocation strategy. They invest in growth stocks or actual equities, and they have fixed income. And what you do is you weigh what, you know, how much do we have in equities? How much do we have in fixed income? What you're really doing is creating diversification and creating an, a different investment mix. So it's the old story. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. You have to understand that. If you're in one basket, right, you either have a, if you're in a 100% fixed income, you have a very low rate of return. If you're 100% in equities, you're going to see tremendous volatility and you're taking on significant risk. This is investing 101. And why I focus on this is a lot of people, when we go back to that first slide of budgeting, have to live off of their investment income. And then we also have to determine how long will it last. So why is it important? Again, what are your goals? I, gotta gener I need to generate income, right? I wanna maximize my return by managing the risk. Then we have the types of investors. That's important for you to understand also because many investors don't understand, you know, they just, they'll walk up and they'll walk up to a professional like myself and say, I need this and so forth. Well, I don't know what type of investor you are. And what I mean by that is, are you risk averse? We have had three down days in the market. Are you running to your advisor to sell? Are you selling something? I don't know, you know, if you, if, if you are chicken little and always worried about the sky falling, as soon as things go negative, you may get out. But your goal may be five years from now. So you may not want to turn around and sell at a low. This is lower than it was five days ago. It's higher than it was in the beginning of the year. 
Maybe we've met our goals for the year. And yes, you have to reallocate and you have to you know, change your investment strategy, but we need to understand who you are. So what kind of investors are you? Uh, there is a, there, there are, you know, in July of 2021, the government adopted a, a law, right, that for all financial advisors, not, you know, not Joe Soroselli, but for all financial advisors that talk about what they call the best interest goal. The first thing it says is anytime somebody talks to you, they have to give you what they call a CRS, a customer relationship summary. And it explains what they are going to do and how they're gonna be paid and any other relevant facts for either the broker dealer, for the advisor, uh, you know, and on it, you know, here's where you can check me out, brokercheck.com. It's where you can check out your, your advisor uh, to see if he's had complaints or anything else. Most people don't, but I've been doing this for 40 years. I have, I have, I, uh, you know, and it's just the advisor always should talk about it. Uh, I have one complaint about 10 years ago that was, you know, never settled or anything else was found to be, it was found to be not uh, a complaint, right? It was just, it was, it was nothing, but everything goes to the broker check everything, especially for a good advisor, right? The, I, you know, if, if you called me up and said, I just need, you know, I don't understand this, I'll report it to my company. They'll put it on broker check and we'll have explained it and it will be rectified. That's the great thing about it. But you, we have to know what sort of investor you are. So the first thing is this customer relationship summary, then you should be doing some sort of risk questionnaire. And that's what the scoring system is, what kind of investor you are, sort of like gives us that risk tolerance that you have. And then in that relationship summary, we talk about goals. What am I trying to do for you? And then what's your time horizon? Those are the questions because that's how an advisor can help you. And that's how an advisor, when we go back, and I keep on, I'm going to say, we go back to the financial plan. When you talk about that financial plan, that sort of like helps dictate out your goals. If you're coming to a person just to do one thing, that's great. Some people like to use five different people for five different objects. Sometimes myself in what we, you know, for financial fitness, you do need that quarterback. You do need somebody that's going to coordinate everything. You can be it, but you know how we talked about, you know, financial fitness in 2021 and beyond, there is going to be somebody else that has to be involved. And we're going to talk about that. Well, risk versus return, real simple. The more the riskier the investment is, the higher the return. That's it. Bottom is U.S. Treasury bills. Top is international stocks, and now they could be, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies, right? But that, that's the highest risk in return. Not going further on this. Once again, back to financial planning, right? When you're talking about an investment mix, how much will you need? How much do you need? Do you need to generate income? When is it going to be due? When am I going to need this money? All of these are things you have to discuss, you know, for financial fitness, because there's no one answer. You can't take a generic one answer and make, you know, apply it to everybody because your financial situation and the person sitting next to you, or if we were in a, in a live seminar, but the person in the little window next to you, right? Uh, they're different. That's why it has to, you have to go through a process, not you know, just, oh, I'm going to go buy this. If you are going to be a completely do-it-yourself investor, then go pick the stocks that you want. But I will tell you, financially going forward, somebody else has to know what you're doing and what your goals are. Because this is a little scary, which people don't understand, is if you own a brokerage account and you own stocks, and God forbid, you die, right? That broker can't trade that stock until he understands who the executor is. There is no discretion. You gave that broker discretion to trade stocks, potentially, not always, but you gave him, when you die, that discretion is gone. So having a second person on the account or in some way is very important, especially as we get older. Uh, and I am getting older, all right? Second question is, you know, you know, how long will your money last? I am everybody I'm planning for right now. We talk about age 100. 
somebody, I'm, I am married, happily married, 41 years, right? So when we talk about our money, and I, and I always talk about family and our, not mine or hers or whatever else, we talk about the family money, right? It's got to last another 40 years. She, you know, or approximately 40 years at least. And going forward, who knows? If I took a survey in this room right now, right, I can tell you at least one or two people have some sort of artificial joint. It's just natural. We're living longer. I tell people these joints are great. When if before, if you had arthritis, a bad hip, you became sedentary, you then got diabetes, then you got overweight, and then eventually you died, right? Now you have a bad hip in the 60s or 70s, right? You go get your hip replaced and you keep active. You keep walking. You keep your, your pain is gone. You're not unhappy. It's just the way things are. Medicine is extending our life. So we have to make sure our money lasts. So you need to do it. Whereas these average mortalities, I think they're a lot longer. As I said, my father made it to 99. My mother did not. My mother made it to 82 and a half. And everything I just described took place. Bad hip, diabetes, heart condition, died at 82, right? My father had quadruple bypass in his 80s and he made it into his 90s. All right, now let's talk about what's in the news every day today or every day this week. Inflation. Remember we talked, we now, we now covered basically, all right, I need to figure out where my income, top left-hand corner of a financial plan or a budget. How much money am I coming in? Social Security, pension, investment income. That's my income. That's where it's coming from. Then we said all of these expenses. I don't know about anybody else, but I was very happy last year when I went and filled up, and I have a, 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 I have a car, I'm not a gas guzzler, but I have a car. I was very happy last year when I went to fill up my tank of gas and paid $35. Okay, Now I'm paying $50 plus. Things have gotten more expensive. The news today, oh, the, uh, the producer price index increased 10% year over year from last year, right? Uh, the consumer prices, inflation, 8% or excuse me, 7%, 6.8% year over year. Things are costing more, right? This was, and I'm gonna say this, the, this was previous numbers. I, uh, from the previous slide, I can, I'll can i update this for the next presentation, but these new numbers came out. If we projected out 7 8, you know, seven percent inflation, that means my, my $3, and they're saying $3.30 gallon of gas, $0.32 gallon of gas, right, in 10 years will cost me $6.70. Basically, it's the rule of 72. Expenses, money doubles every 10 years at 7%, 7.2%. So we have to take this into account. And then if you're working off of a, a close budget, and I, I use that, you know, where, where income, you know, in January was well over what I needed to turn around and pay my expenses. And now that expenses have gotten bigger, now I may have to be taking a little bit more from my investment income. How will that affect me long-term? Financial fitness, you have to know. I know if I exercise, and I use fitness as a thing, if I exercise, my weight and possibly my blood pressure will come, come, down, you know, come down. I know the results of my plan, of my exercise plan. You have to know the results of your financial plan to be fit. You have to understand if I do X, it'll improve Y. That's so, so important because how does it work? Right. Uh, well, I'm going to you know talk about you know this is another slide and I'm uh, deviating a little bit, but you know it, it's that second line. Everything is a process. You know, if you're talking about investment and diversification, balance the risk overall. Uh, by the way, bottom right hand side, not a lot of people too. People tell me I'm very diversified, but then they send me their their portfolio and they own American Funds growth, they own Vanguard growth, they own XYZ growth, they own the they all own the same stocks. So they may have, you know, they may all own, they're not really diversified. Diversification is different asset al allocation or asset categories and understanding it. This goes back to do it myself, right, investor, or do it for me. A do it myself investor could be in this room. It could be ver very much 
uh, a person in this room may be very, very literate on what they're doing. Right? Uh, there are also, you know, funds that will, uh, will, will allow you to do that. And then there's, you know, do it for me, right? And that's when you hire an advisor. And now that you, it's required since July of last year that the advisor talk to you about what their expenses are and what expenses you're going to actually have, uh, you'll understand a lot more. But I always talk about people is we don't, we don't self-diagnose our physical conditions. We don't self-diagnose, you know, uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, most people go to mechanics when they haven't, you know, when they're not certain of what's going on with their car. So if you're not certain what's going on with your financial picture or your financial fitness, you go to somebody that can help you, right? If you, you know, if you want a specialist or a person that understands what's going on, you go to people, you get in, you hire an advisor, you go to a professional, whether it's a professional money manager or a professional financial advisor, financial planner. But you have to, you have to do it. And I'm going to use something that's a little old school. And yes, I'm a little old school. I've been doing this for 40 years. As, as Sarah said, I, I started with the senior law day back in the 90s. Uh, it's been a long time. Uh, it's been a long time that I've been involved with them. But on that old school side, side is this really three simple criteria when you're dealing with somebody. You first have to know them. They have to be, they have to, you, you have to understand who they are. A lot of people like referrals, no question about it, right? But you can look up a person and you can, you can get to know them, right? You have to like them. You have to believe that they like you, that they have your best interest at heart, right? And then you have to trust them because Trust is a very hard thing that has to be earned. So sometimes it starts out slow and then builds. And sometimes you inherit trust because ABC person says XYZ person is the greatest you know, individual in the world. But you have to know them. You have to know who they are, what their credentialing is. You have to like them, right? Because nobody likes to deal with somebody they don't like. Uh, and then you have to trust them. Once those are established, then I think you might have an advisor. So review, we got to talk about, about volatility. We know what's going on. Uh, nobody can predict the market, but with a diversified investment portfolio, you're pretty safe, right? Uh, it should weather. In other words, you're not going to make as much. If the Dow goes up, you know, 10%, right? you might only go up 6% because you have some fixed income investments. But if that's the goal, that's the goal. Because remember, we talk about risk and we talk about, you know, how much risk you want to take. And then we also talk about return. The lower the risk, the more diverse your portfolio is, right? We can we change the amount of return. And you know, that yields an asset allocation program. And then that yields who's going to do it? You can do it yourself, or you can do, you know, you can have somebody do it for you. All right, let's come back to slide one. Now that we know that we have to, you know, part of my my you know, uh, financial plan is going to deal with income. All those numbers come in. We know that, right? And then part of that income is investing. And then we know, in, you know that the other part of a financial plan is expenses and projecting them going forward. Best way to say it is we, we got to have some idea of what we're looking at. Uh, you know, people plan to buy houses. I, I used to I use a phrase, you know, people plan for weddings, they plan for this, they plan for that. A lot of people don't, you know, shouldn't we be planning for our financial future and our financial fitness? As I said, today and, to, you know, in the future. Now, I'm going to, you know, keep on talking about financial planning as a way of creating financial fitness, because that's the only way you can, you can do it. And then there's other aspects that, you know, how do you protect yourself? But on a financial plan, it starts with an asset allocation, whatever it may be. You have a target allocation, you have your current allocation. The target is what we recommend based upon the questions we ask, and the current allocation is where you're actually at. That's it. And then what do we expect the returns to be? Right? And then what we do is we do an, an analysis and we project out within ranges. There's two, what they call standard deviations, right? Or confidence levels, right? Here's the line from history, the solid blue line. Here's the line, here's the, you know, if we're a little bit different, you know, uh, with a 
uh, 25, you know, to 75 condensed level, right? It just changes. Is how much spread? What what could be the spread? And do I have an income shortage, or you know, do I have excess? Right? You see, in this case, there starts to, you know, you have to start down drawing more money from different accounts later on. Actually, in this financial plan, I think they said they only wanted one, they, they had the first death at 90, so that you see money coming into the portfolio, which is life insurance. Some people have it, some people don't, but it is a way of injecting money into, a, into an investment plan or a retirement plan. And then it comes down to black and white numbers. Here's what we expect the expenses to be, the compound by its inflation, here's our income, all the other. It's numbers. I'm not going to look at this. Now, let's talk about an expense that just all took place. Anybody, everybody made some sort of a decision. Now, not, it does, it, it's not over, by the way. Your decision-making process for Medicare is not over. If you want to turn around and go to what they call a Medicare Part C plan, not just A, B, and D, and then a supplement, right? You can turn around and enroll in a Part C plan all through the first quarter and, and a little beyond. You have an extended enrollment period for Medicare Part C plans. And if you did join a Medicare Part C plan in this enrollment period, changed from traditional, the traditional A, B, D, and supplement to a Part C plan, which is in a C, Medicare Part C, it's an HMO or a PPO. You're basically transferring the risk from the government and yourself to some insurance company. They take that premium from the government and they give you an insurance policy. They give you a network of providers, right? It, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty much an HMO or a PPO. You have a preferred provider. They give you all sorts. Everybody's seeing Joe Namath. You're seeing all sorts of stars. All the stars from, you know, our, I'm gonna say my generation and a little bit older that, that uh, are, not, are now promoting Medicare Part C plans or what they call Medicare Advantage programs. These can be zero cost. When you stay with a, a, a Medicare, you know, the traditional Medicare, basically Medicare Part A, Medicare Part B, depending upon your income, you're gonna pay anywhere from 160 to, you know, even more if your income is very high, right? For your Medicare Part B insurance. Then you have your Part D insurance, which is a prescription, right? Which you pay for also. And then to get that little 20% that Medicare doesn't cover, covered, you buy a Medicare supplement plan. They range from 250 to, you know, as high as $500, right? So, you know, when you back to that budget, well, wait a minute, if I go to, you know, a Medicare Part C plan and all of my doctors are in this network. My hospital is in this network. It has a good prescription plan inside the network and all. You can su save substantially. And if it's a husband and wife, right? We're talking about monthly savings of anywhere between 500 and, you know, plus per month. That's your, you know, in, I'm in Lower Wesha. That's my Con Ed bill. That, that you know is a way of you know planning forward, and the beautiful thing about it is, it's an annual decision. If I don't like it, I can change it, and if I don't like the plan that I chose, I can change the plan I chose. Or you know, it, there's a lot of flexibility here. So you do need to talk to you know. It's not it's it's not that somebody's just trying to sell you. And hopefully they're not, right? But they're analyzing. First question that I always tell every one of my clients is. Talk to your doctor's office or talk to your practice. Uh, Lower Westchester, West Med is a big practice. I belong to West Med. I talk to my West Med doctor and find out. Uh, I find out if my if the surgeon is involved is covered. You basically find out are they participating in this network? If they are, and the hospital participates and it has a decent drug plan, it may be a way of of reducing your expenses. So Medicare Part C is there. So let's think. You know, quick review identify for financial fitness where your money's coming from and how your investment portfolio is doing. Then talk about expenses. How can we reduce them? And be aware that inflation is eating away at them. All right. Now, the next thing. We're, right, we're getting close, right? Uh, the next piece of this puzzle, right? Cyber, cyber thieves, account takeovers. Great thing. 
that's taking place right now. And I think it's great. It's a, it's a pain in the ass. I was going to say a PIA, right? But it's a pain in the ass. But these third-party authentication, you, I use, I use bank, I do use online banking. Every time I go to my online account, I'm getting a text to say, is it you? You know something? It's a bit of a pain, but I like it. Because if somebody else is trying to get in, they don't have my phone in their hand that gets the text. Right? I often say, and some people are very you know, good at you know, working with text, but this is a, a safety measure because there is an alternative. And this is back to account takes takeovers. If a person got your information for your bank account through an online, they breached your computer, they got into your computer and they're trying to take over your username and your identity and everything else, they may have it, but they don't have your phone in, your, in their hand. Okay, so they do or may have access to your email. The alternative way of getting this third, this set, you know, secondary recognition is having an email sent to you with the PIN code. I don't recommend it. Try to get used to using your phone because if they're in your computer, they probably have access to your to your uh, email, right? They probably got the account information or identity that you deal with chase you deal with whatever right from that email account or in some way so if you send the pin to them to via an email they're going to get access to it they don't have your phone a text while i, I i've learned i uh, 10 years ago i was anti-text now i'm literate uh, and i know how to use it and i'm happy about it but it is a way to help avoid an account takeover. Because if they don't have the pin, most financial institutions will immediately send you a message saying your account was tried to being attempted from IP address 1234, whatever it may be. Was this you? The answer is no. Great. Everything gets locked for a short period of time and you reestablish it. Re re okay. Let's talk about victims. All right. 19, 4.4 million, it, the, the numbers have gone off the grid in 20 and 21 because everybody was working from home. Um, I'll get these updated numbers for you, but it is, it is scary the number of account takeovers and the, uh, the way they're doing it. It's just very scary. So you've got to be concerned about uh, work. Some people say, I just don't want to do anything on the internet. I understand it, but in today's day and age, you have to be computer. I mean, um, and if you share information with somebody, which isn't a bad thing to do, right, in some cases, and I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. If you share information, make sure you're sharing it correctly uh, and with the right person. But let's talk about what do you do to prevent cyber breaches? Well, I just said to you that it's helpful to have somebody have access to your account, right, or know the information to log on, right? But never, never give a stranger a thing. You get phone calls left and right. And you know something that I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit, and I don't have the slides for it, but I am a believer in it. Get the robo, get one of the, subscribe to, if you're on cell phones, your cell phone provider offers a way of stopping you know, auto dialers or fraudulent calls. If you're on a landline, your landline provider, Optimum offers it. There's a number of ways to try to eliminate these robo calls that ask for all sorts of information. But never, never, never give out any, you know, remote access to your computer or information over the phone. I, uh, I like this piece, right? The, the option two is if you are going to use online banking and, you know, for a thing, try to use one location. Don't use multiple. Don't use multiple locations. Use one. So if you're going to log on from your home computer, great. You know that's where you're going to do everything. And that's it. Don't have it on your phone. My, my Chase account is not on my phone. I, it's not on my phone. I get the third party recognition, but I don't have my Chase account on, on the phone, all right? It's on my home computer, all right? Uh, complex passwords, don't use the same ones. Uh, if you're scared about using, comp or that you're not gonna remember a complex passwords, there are password programs that you can get like LastPass, right? That will save the passwords, again, that, that proprietary computer, 
Great. The only complex password you are going to have to remember if you use a password program is the first one. All right. Once you get into the program, then you can look up all the others and it will suggest complex passwords for you, but it will also be your location. Don't put it on a piece of paper and put it under the, under the desk because if somebody gets in and gets a hold of it or takes a picture of it with the phone, right, they have it. Uh, Two-step authentication, greatest thing in the world. I agree with it 100%. It adds the extra layer of security. It tells us where we're at. I uh, make sure that everything is up to date. Uh, you know, for antivirus and anti malware. If you have a, uh, I'm not. I am not an Apple person. I am a PC person. Right. So uh, Microsoft Protector is great. It updates automatically. Right. Perform the software updates when they come. Right. Don't keep on delaying it. Don't delaying it. Because what happens is if they know of a breach, they turn around and correct it right away, right? They, they send out an update to patch and fix it so that somebody else, and right, uh, don't be afraid to ask. What I mean by that is talk to your bank, talk to your you know, brokerage firm, talk to anyone else. And sometimes it's as simple as putting, you know, oh, send me alerts. Yeah, they might become a little... PIA or pains, but I would rather know that somebody's doing things and don't be afraid to put dollar limitations. You can, you can do so much. If you walked into the branch and sat down into the bank and sat down with somebody, and yes, now we're in COVID time, so we're not doing that as much, right? But if you walked in and talked to somebody, right, they'll help you set up all of these things on your account or the 800 numbers usually help. Okay. In the spring, when I first was doing this movie, uh, doing this presentation, there was a movie out that called I Care A Lot. This is so important. If anybody can look it up on Netflix, it's an interesting movie, but it talks about how if you are isolated in some way, even if you're not socially isolated, but you know, there, there's nobody that's there to, you know, to overlook your finances or be there in, on the what if scenario, right? you could be right to turn around and have somebody take, you know, basically become your guardian. It's scary. This movie is a little scary. I mean, it's, I think, overdone. I don't think it's as easy as they make it do, but it does bring out a very important point that there was nobody else, right? Or there might not be anybody else to monitor what's going on. And then, you know, if some judge can turn around and say, you can't take care of yourself and appoint a guardian. And then that guardian is, you, rules your life. Now, sometimes that guardian is necessary. If I am not competent and I'm doing things that shouldn't be done, a guardian may be necessary to protect me, right? To protect my finances, right? Hopefully it's a guardian I will have already previously appointed or designated in some way. Back 101 to the attorney, we're gonna go there in a second, right? But there are documents that you should always have in place that will prevent, in quotes, the movie topic of a total stranger taking over my life, right? Can be prevented. And that's so, so important as we age. And that's why I talk about this time of year, today and all. We're going into one of the biggest family or holiday seasons or family get togethers. You know, it's not a bad idea. I, I used to call it 20 years ago, I used to call it an I love you letter, right? Because there were no videos, there were no anything else that were out there. And I used to tell people, always have a give, give somebody you know an I love you letter. And what it is, is talk to Joe Soricelli about my financials, talk to, you know, uh, and Sarah, I'm not promoting you or anything, but talk to Sarah Sack Steckler about my legal advice talk to Bruce about my banking, talk to whatever, but give them directions and then give them a goal, right? Because if I, God forbid, was by myself, had a stroke, nobody, and you know what? My wife doesn't know where everything is. And it's not that I'm hiding things, but I have business accounts that she's not familiar with. So that's in the I love you letter, right? And it also sort of like lays out the path of who can do what. So you can do it by a video now. You can do it on your phone and send it to somebody. But that avoids some stranger taking over your life by doing that. All right, estate checklist. Part of financial fitness, right? 
you know, uh, husband and wife, you know, single, whatever, right? This is just a really 30,000 square foot piece, but you know, you know, do you have a will, right? Do you need a will? I don't know, right? Do you have, because, you know, a lot of people, if they properly title accounts, everything transfers by what they call contract, not through testament or through a will. You have a power of attorney. A lot of people don't realize power of attorney dies with you. So you may need the will to turn around and appoint somebody to manage your affairs if you didn't have them all in order, right? The living will, what do I want to do? I want to be kept alive. I don't want to be kept alive. I can't tell you, healthcare proxy. Once I describe what I want, you know, uh, I want to be on, you know, a feeding tube, whatever, whatever it may be, I'm just saying, right? Somebody has to, you know, have the authority to do it. That's the healthcare proxy. Somebody else can, you know, allow me to do it, right? Very, 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 very important. Can't give enough varies. Besides beneficiary designations, find out who you're joint with on accounts. Uh, there's another thing which we all talk about, unfortunately, right? We talk about long-term care. We talk about Medicaid. We talk about everything else, right? Knowing, you know, who's joint on an account, uh, who's not joint on an account, who the beneficiaries are, it's so important. Right. Um, and it goes back to that I love you letter. Right. It sort of designates things because I can't tell you how many times there are, you know, there are problems because of in, inappropriate or the wrong beneficiary designations. I'm going through something right now that a person wants their will to take precedence over everything else. So we're actually having to change beneficiary designations to the estate, which then pushes it back up to the will. Otherwise, otherwise they found out I, I've had to tell them basically. You know, ABC person is going to inherit this this account based upon the beneficiary designation, and they were like, "No, I don't want that." Well, it should they should be reviewed, and then a living trust and other trusts. There's different ways of doing, it. but you have to talk to an advisor, an attorney, to go through this. Well, I might be able to give you these ninety thousand square foot, you know, level overviews. No, I am not giving you legal advice. I'm telling you to, you know, here's what you you should review. Here's things that you should have, and you should talk to an attorney to get them created. And that's pretty much it, right? So, you know, if I was to back up, right, and we're right on time, 1045, I got it right, I got it, I did it well, right? Uh, we're gonna open it up for some questions and answers, questions, um, and then, you know, I hope you enjoyed it. I wanna give a quick summary, put together a financial plan, Know where your income's coming from. Know where your, uh, ex your expenses are. That projects out. Second thing is share information with somebody, right? Hopefully a trusted family member of some sort. Uh, we, and I'm gonna, and this is going back to, uh, I'm gonna say, I reference changes in guidelines and laws in July. I am a fiduciary. That in essence says, I have to have your best interest at heart. I have to disclose everything. If I have a conflict of interest, I have to disclose it. And what I mean by conflict of interest, there are people that you know should, and they got they gave guidance that they're not supposed to give you advice on certain accounts, right? From a financial standpoint, because there could be a conflict of interest. Uh, most appropriate conflict of interest sometimes is, oh, take your money out of your 401k. Your 401k expenses against that money might be basis points, six, seven, eight basis points. They say, oh, give it to me and I'm gonna invest it for you, right? And now your expenses went from basis points to 1% plus. I'm not telling you it's not the appropriate thing to do because you may have need more personalization, but understand that. And that's what the law in July basically said is full disclosure, right? And the law is called the best interest law, that whether you're a broker or a fiduciary advisor, you have to have the best interest of your client. Bruce, I'm throwing it back to you and Sarah. You tell me what to do now. Yeah, there was, um. well, we have one question and then uh, we'd encourage people to put questions in the Q&A, but there was a comment earlier on in the chat that we received. I just wanted to read it to you. And then if you want to further comment, this individual felt that the medical category back in the expense sheet that you showed in the beginning um, should break it out further into out-of-pocket deductible expenses uh, for visits, prescription costs, 
over the uh, med over the counter medications and other medical costs. So they just felt like medical was such a big um, medical at this stage in life. In most cases is the largest expense. Right? There's no question that we have to break it out. But when you're working with a person one on one, then you do it. Then that flows into and again, I, this is a uh, you know, 45 minute presentation. It's not a, you know, it's not an in detail one on one. And I go back to everybody's circumstances are different because when you, what that person just described, right, could be a, you know, traditional Medicare person who has part A, part B, part D, and a RAP plan. And different deductibles, different things take place. Then you go to the Medicare part C, the advantage program. Most of that may be zero or none in the advantage programs, right? That's when insurance companies compete and every advantage program is not the same. So yes, you have to understand but information that's out there. But yeah, uh, if you're looking at you know, expenses, it's, I take prescriptions, right? I know what my projected. I actually, one of my prescriptions just went from formulatory to non formulatory and there's a genetic, uh, generic alternative. I went from paying $50 a month down to $5 a month. It's <laughs> you know, massive, massively different. Massively different. Uh, I, so wish yes, I, I wish I paid $5 a month for my prescriptions. Analyze these things, but that's something that you do one-on-one. -on -one. You don't do it generically. And the generically, Medical has an expense, and how do you control it? Another question um, that I see that I see in the chat is sometimes at year end, uh, Congress in the U.S. will pass legislation that has an impact on, well, really on everybody and their taxes, you know, but but especially can have an impact on estate planning or people with limited income. I don't know if there's anything that you anticipate or you've heard in the last. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. And Bruce, this is, you know, these, que these questions are coming from a targeted audience, I think, uh, on that side. But yes, very much. If you, all year long, all year long, we heard about the Biden tax program and how they're going to reduce, they're, they're going to reduce, change the estate tax exemption, so forth and so on. Uh, last I looked, it's December 16th, right? It's not on the agenda. Now, there are little known caveats within, you know, within Congress. They could theoretically backdate. They haven't. Yeah. So if they, if they adopted a change in the estate tax law in March, right, they could theoretically backdate it to January 1. They haven't in the past because the, I can't, I wouldn't want to, I couldn't imagine the number of lawsuits that were, you know, things that would take place. So, yeah, do we expect changes? A lot of what everybody talked about was you have to do these changes before year end. Well, guess what? It's year end right now. I take advice from other advisors. I had two very, 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 very good accountants that I trust, know, like, and trust that all we talked about is be prepared and let's see, but let's wait until they do something. Well, they didn't do anything. The likelihood of them doing something in the next two weeks could happen. Could happen. There could be changes. I don't expect there to be. Do I expect changes in 2022? Yes. Talk to an advisor, talk to somebody that is in the knowledge, but you didn't have to act. A lot of people acted in 2021, and now we're finding out they didn't have to because nothing was changed. So while well, we just wait for any last questions, if you want to stop sharing your screen. Okay. And um, at the end, um, Sarah, you want to jump in? Sure, and, and Joe, we had a participant ask if you'll be posting your budget sheet or if it can be sent to them. So for individuals who want a copy of your budget sheet to take a crack at doing their own budgets, okay. how may they um, connect with you? Uh, again, uh, Joe Soroselli, right? My comp it's joe at agingissuesinfo.com, A-G-I-N-G-I-S-S. U-E-S-I-N-F-O dot com and just Joe at it. My phone number is 468-914-468-0186. Uh, send me a note, give me a call, whatever. Uh, I'll send you out. I also, the software that, you, that everything was being drafted from, I make available to everyone. I have a, needless to say, we pay for the software. 
you can share information, you can use the software, we could talk about it, or I could just send you the sheets or actually this entire presentation uh, via PowerPoint. Uh, I'm happy to share whatever is necessary. And I'm also happy, you don't have to do business with me. We could, you know, uh, what I mean by that is you just, you know, walk through the financial planning process. Uh, once you walk through it, I, then you begin to realize how important it is uh, because it really does. And you do need you do need software or somebody to project out what's going to happen. And part of it is, are we looking at in quotes double digit inflation, which is what they're talking about right now, or what I what I the the illustration that you saw in there had an uh, inflation rate of three percent. Well, right now it's double that because the inflation rate was three percent. I don't know what it's going to be in the future, but we will be making adjustments to everybody's financial plans. Okay, so if anyone has additional questions, please put them in the chat or in the Q&A. And, oh, actually our question asker who wanted to break out the medical uh, says that, how do you communicate your budget sheets with your client's CPA? And uh, what little tips and tricks can you share? Okay, when you, the budget sheets are, could be as simple as what you are looking at, what you looked at, or what I have the ability to do uh, is within the software package that we do after we develop it all, right? I subsequently uh, give limited access to third parties. So they can't make any changes, they can't do anything else, but they can see it. And one of the reasons why it's important, somewhat important, I don't have a monopoly on information or uh, advice. But if a third party sees what's going on and gets that good financial picture, right? Uh, and I often say share it with a family member, right? So they have an idea of what's going on because my kids worry about me and my wife. We're not, we're not old. I, I, I don't consider ages in the mind only. I mean, I, I know, eight, you know, I know you have Warren Buffett in his 90s still running a billion dollar, you know, multi billion dollar organization. Right. Age is there. And then you have people that, you know, need help early on. So it's always good to have some other third party that's just monitoring because, you know, and if we're, if we're in a senior audience, our kids worry about us. Right. There's no way to, no other way to put it. Uh, I'm hoping our kids worry about us. Right. And they're not just planning on an inheritance, but information can be shared in a number of ways. One thing goes back to cyber security. Whenever you share something, never, never share an entire account number. Last four digits. Let them guess on the, on the other five or six digits. Last four digits. Let's people identify, I have Chase account number one, two, three, four, right? Balance is $110,000, right? Whatever, right? They don't have access to, access to it, right? Uh, never share full account numbers. Uh, on anything, right? That's important. Uh, and as I said, you can create what, however, it could be a, it could be a, a legal pad. It could be a list of things and you can share it with somebody. But efficiency, I share access to the software. They just go on it, click a button, say, okay, I see what's, going, what's happening. And they also see the investments. So they said, okay, the income's coming from here. And then they see the projection and either they agree or they disagree. Very good. Bruce, would you mind sharing your screen and showing the Senior Law Day website yeah, yeah, where yeah. those materials will be posted in a few days? Sure. So this is Senior Law Day. So just by, so basically this is where you'll get, you'll see it, right? Where this is our last webinar and that will be replaced by Friday with Joe's. Um, and then I just wanted to um, also show you, this is a, if you have just any other questions that are more specific to your situation, you just click on this Ask Us button and someone will get back to you uh, shortly. Do you, wanna, do you wanna click on it to show the sure. what pops up? Easy form. So you, you type your your question and if your name, if you would like to share that yeah. and how you want us to get back to you, whether it's a, a call or an email. And the last thing that I um, wanted to do was just to thank our sponsors who make these programs possible 
including the, the firm that Sarah is a partner at, Lorsher Burstein. We have financial planners, geriatric care managers, other supporters, including uh, a foundation that's listed there. So thank you very much. This has been, you know, we, we appreciate the feedback. And with that, I'm going to end this webinar and, and uh, wish everyone a, a very good day. Thanks again, Joe. Take care. Thanks. Sarah. Thanks, guys.